Kindly take your seats. Yes, dear members of the audience, you convinced me this morning that when Dr. Seth reaches here, you'll give him a befitting hand clap. Yes, congratulations. And Dr. Seth, we welcome you to Makere University, your home. Reading the biography, I was able to tell that you're one of us, you've, been our, you've ever been our member of staff in the then medical school. Welcome home. We are happy that you're returning when Makere University is celebrating 100 years of existence. That's no mean achievement. Let us welcome, in line with our program, the Dean School of Public Health to introduce the keynote speaker who was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science honoris causa of Makere University. Professor Roda Nienze, you're welcome. Thank you, Rita, for the introduction. Mr. Vice-Chancellor and uh, members of management, I have the pleasure to introduce to you our keynote speaker today, uh, uh, Dr. Seth Buckley, who was awarded an honorary Doctor of Science of Macquarie University uh, early this year. We are delighted that he's been able to come and join us in person uh, this time, and that he's going to speak to us on a very important uh, topic we are also delighted to have our Honorable Minister of Health, uh, Dr. Jen Ruth Cheng, and uh, the top management of the Ministry of Health, and several partners who are here today to be a part of this occasion, because Dr. Seth Buckley is a friend of Uganda, a friend of the Ministry of Health, and uh, he's served our communities uh, diligently for a long time, as you'll hear from his uh, 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 biography. Dr. Seth Buckley is a pioneer in global public health and for the last 35 years he has been a, and a driving force to improve the way that the world pre prevents and responds improve the way that the world pre prevents and responds to infectious diseases. He is a medical doctor and an infectious disease epidemiologist, and he joined uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, as its CEO about 12 years ago. Under his leadership, Gavi has accelerated global immunization. He has especially had a special focus on supporting us from the lower and middle income countries especially Africa and Uganda in particular, as part of this effort. During his tenure at Gavi, the organization increased coverage of routine Recording stopped. vaccinations in our countries. And every year, Gavi protects nearly half of the world's children, vaccinating more than one billion children in just over two decades, reducing deaths um, from vaccine preventable diseases by 70% and preventing more than 16.2 million future deaths. Dr. Seth Buckley has also played a pivotal role in changing the way the world prevents and responds to global health crisis by helping accelerate the development of and access to new vaccines against diseases such as Ebola. And he has led the way in ensuring emergency vaccine stockpiles for diseases of epidemic potential, including Ebola, meningitis, yellow fever, and cholera. Dr. Buckley has taken the case for vaccine equity and placed it at the center of the global health agenda, warning of the growing threat of pandemics in the face of global trends like climate change, urbanization, population growth, conflict, 
humanitarian migration, and antimicrobial resistance. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Buckley co-created the COVAX, which I'm sure many of you have heard about because it was our savior, and many of us were watching it all through the past two years. This is the only global multilateral solution aimed at providing equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines for people in all countries, regardless of their ability to pay. And as a leader of COVAX, Dr. Buckley helped to drive international COVID-19 pandemic response by working with partners and the leaders of 193 economies to put in place the mechanisms and funding to secure and ship recording in progress more than and ship more than 1.8 billion doses to 146 economies let's clap to that <laughs> this included providing close to 1.6 billion doses to people in 87 lower income economies to ensure that nobody is left behind. Prior to joining the Global Vaccine Initiative, in 1996, Dr. Buckley founded the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, the first vaccine product development public-private sector partnership where he served as the president and CEO for 15 years. And under his leadership, Ayavi created a virtual vaccine product development effort involving scientists from low-income countries, industry, and academia, developing and testing HIV vaccines around the world. He also oversaw a global advocacy program that ensured HIV vaccines received prominent attention in the media and in the forums such as the G8, the European Union, and the United Nations. Previously, Dr. Buckley served as an officer of the Health Sciences Division in the Rockefeller Foundation. He has worked for the Centers for Infectious Diseases of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Massachusetts Department of Public Health and the Qatar Center, where he was assigned as an epidemiologist at the Ministry of Health in Uganda, playing a key role in Uganda's first national HIV serum survey and helping to develop its national AIDS control program. Thank you. Dr. Buckley has been featured on the cover of Newsweek magazine, recognized by Time magazine as one of the Time 100 world's most influential people. He was named by Wired Mag magazine as among the Wired 25, a salute of dreamers. Inventors, mavericks, leaders, and his TED Talks have been viewed by more than two million people. He has published hundreds of articles and opinion pieces. He has consulted and worked in more than 50 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Dr. Buckley received his undergraduate and medical degrees from Brown University and trained in international medicine at Harvard University. In 2013, he was awarded an honorary doctorate by Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth in South Africa for his services to global public health and advancing the right to health uh, to health care for all. In 2021, he received an honorary doctor of science degree from Macquarie University. And we are privileged to have been able to do this. But thereafter, he also received uh, an honorary doctorate from Brown, Brown University, where he was awarded, again, an honorary degree of Doctor of Medical Science for having achieved great distinction as a physician and public health leader. Also, in 2022, he was elected to the United States National Academy of Medicine.
We do celebrate the contribution that Dr. Buckley has made for us, particularly uh, in Uganda and other countries, as one of the people that supported the first mass of public health programs on the African continent, including our very own full-time master of public health in Makerere, which is close to 30 years now, alongside other programs in Ghana and Zimbabwe. We appreciate Dr. Buckley for his commitment for capacity building and sustainability through human capital development. This is our keynote speaker for today, very distinguished, great service to humanity. Very welcome. So um, I, I must say thank you for that lovely, lovely introduction. And it really is wonderful to be home. I want to acknowledge the presence of the Vice Chancellor, Minister Achang, um, the Dean for that um, not only um, a warm welcome, but also for your leadership um, in, in public health. And um, I promised her when we had the discussion about the honorary doctorate, right in the middle of the COVID outbreak, um, that I would come back in person. So here I am. And it, it's a special moment for me because I have many friends that I've worked with over the years, including, uh, you know, Sam Aquari, who I did the work on, on um, AIDS with years ago, and your own David Sawada, Nelson Selwyn Combo. I can run down the list of people. And, and just to say as an introduction, it was a very difficult time when I came in the 1980s. It was a time when um, Uganda had had um, uh, years of insecurity, a devastated public health system, and this terrible new disease, HIV, which was really poorly understood. And during the, the almost three years I spent here as a um, epidemiologist working at the Ministry of Health, but also an attending physician at Malago, uh, not because that was my job, but because Malago at that point needed help because there weren't enough faculty to be able to teach. And I saw the effects of, of, the, the, of the severe diseases that were existing. And we did some extraordinary things. We established um, the first AIDS surveillance system across then 33 districts, 15 million population. Um, the first um, a systematic um, AIDS surveillance system in Africa. We carried out a national zero survey and the president published the results unlike neighbors who were hiding their results. And we established, um, uh, you know, I think the leading continent um, national AIDS control program and really talked about the importance transparently, and I think that's critical. We validated the AIDS clinical definition and, and led the pathway for other countries. But many other things since then, you've heard about some of them in the introduction. And, and you know, today as a leading institution, the first university in East Africa to offer degrees in public health, uh, Macquarie is training people, and this is the most important thing because it's the next generation. You're continuing to do important uh, research, including um, preparing now for the trial of Ebola Sudan vaccine, um, and I've met the, 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 the head of the, the, um, the principal investigator here. Um, over the weekend, I visited um, Malago Hospital to see my old teaching ward 4B, um, and what I saw as a reflection is how far Uganda has come compared to that many years ago, and I, I think we all need to be proud on what has happened. Um, so I'm going to shift to my academic lecture, but before I do that, I just want to say again how much it means to me to receive this degree, and I consider myself a citizen of Uganda. So if we could have the slides, please. Do I control that or the slides? There we go. Okay. So I'm going to take you through a quick tour. Um, we're going to have a little introduction. We're going to talk about what Gavi does a little bit more than we've already heard from the Dean. And then we're going to talk a little bit about Uganda. And I want to start, though, going back, because I do believe in history. And um, if you look on the left here, this was the really the first you know, book on AIDS in Africa that was done here by our own Eli Katabira, um, and um, Tasso was an innovation, and this was about 
taking the learnings from here, taking care of the people with the limited interventions we had, and, 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 um, and then spreading this around the continent to help people understand. On the right was the first um, uh, evaluation of the immunization system, and I'll show you data later. Um, but just to say that at that point, there were, uh, the coverage rate was 21% of six antigens in a population of 15 million, and you'll see where we've come since then. So very important to know about where we've come from, and I know there are many problems still, but how far we have come. Um, I also, um, you know, here I am as a much younger man. Um, um, unfortunately, some of the people in this slide have passed away, but some are still with us. And uh, you see here the uh, much younger Dean um, Nelson Sewin Combo. Um, uh, for me, it was also an opportunity to really get to know some of the, you know, ultimately which will be important leaders here, and not just to get to know them academically, but here's a picture of Nelson Sewin Combo sailing a boat in the middle of the ocean. Um, and I had an opportunity to develop those types of friendships and and exposed people to um, many of the things around the world, which was really great. Now, let's talk a little bit about, about vaccines. And vaccines are amazing tools. You all know the first vaccine was um, um, from smallpox. That's where um, the name comes. Um, and the reason they use the name um, vaccines is comes from vodka and cows, because it was cowpox they used, which actually turns out, for you academic uh, people who care about vaccines, it turns out now that it's actually probably horsepox. And um, now that we can do the genetic analyses, all these years we thought it was cowpox, it's actually probably horsepox. But it didn't matter, it worked. And you can see that there's been a real renaissance of vaccines. You can't read the little names here, but the point you see is that there's just been more and more vaccines that are occurring, 91 licensed vaccines now, and this is very important because this is about prevention. And as the president said the other day, um, you know, we train people to um, be disease doctors and to treat diseases, but if we really want to take care of the population, we have to be promoters of health. And uh, vaccines are a way to promote health and to keep people healthy. This has contributed dramatically to a drop in child mortality. If you look at the 57 poorest countries, we've seen a more than 50% reduction in, in, in under five child mortality with the coverage of vaccines. So it's, of course, impossible to attribute directly, but certainly it's a big contributing factor. And um, this is something that we have to keep in mind um, when we talk about the importance of vaccines. Um, and if you look at it, there is really no other intervention that touches so many lives. Vaccines are uh, the most widely distributed health intervention in the world. Um, uh, um, on average, in the world, about 90% of families are touched by at least one dose of routine vaccines. And so this is the system to build on for other health interventions. Now, Gavi has a really weird um, way of working. It is not a separate organization, and in fact is an alliance. And I'm very happy to see our, the, uh, the, the um, uh, representative for WHO who's here is an alliance partner, um, as is UNICEF, as is the Gates Foundation, the World Bank, and many other partners. And the idea here is we want to move the whole field forward and we also don't want to duplicate. So our overhead rates are very low, and as a result, we've been very trusted as an institution to um, uh, be able to move forward. And so this is it's sometimes complicated. It's like a dysfunctional family sometimes, but together we can make extraordinary things happen. And equity is the core of what it is we work on. Um, our, our mission statement is to save lives and protect people's health by increasing equitable and sustainable use of vaccines. Um, we started around the year 2000 um, in 73 low-income countries initially, but as countries get wealthier, as I'll show you in a minute, you graduate out of Gavi. So today, we support 57 countries, although when the COVID emergency occurred, we um, decided, in fact, to support a much larger number of countries given the emergency that was happening. So um, some of the work we do now is a little different in, in those countries. And over time, what we've seen back at the beginning was very few vaccines, 
um, important vaccines. The first cancer vaccine, which is hepatitis B, yellow fever, obviously an important vaccine. But over time, we've brought other vaccines. And um, you can see here, just to call out the uh, cervical cancer vaccine, HPV, which is the largest cancer killer of women in Africa, um, but also important vaccines against other diseases, and um, Ebola in 2018, typhoid in 2019. And of course, in this year, we've brought um, COVID-19, as well as the first malaria vaccine, which is a soon to start rollout. Um, over this 20 plus year period, we've rolled out 561 new vaccines to countries, and um, um, that doesn't include COVID vaccines, which of course is complicated to count because we introduced many different COVID vaccines in many different countries. So, and um, here in Uganda, um, you know, we've provided 48 million doses of vaccine to give you an idea of the magnitude. So you've already heard the impact at scale. This is looking at over time. It says greater than 981 million. That's our official number, but that was the end of last year. So um, uh, um, the dean was right to say over a billion additional children. And what you can see also is the march up of coverage of other vaccines across the world. Now, all isn't good. Um, um, there are uh, more than 130 million children born in 2021. Um, about 25 million of these are under immunized. And here's the distribution of where those are. Um, obviously, some of them in some quite large countries. And um, so, you know, we look at this, about one in five isn't receiving the full course. And, and most of those are in the Gavi countries because they're in the poorer countries. And, and importantly, we've pivoted to a new concept called zero dose. There are um, 12.5 million zero dose children now. Um, there used to be only 9 million, um, but with um, uh, uh, COVID, we've seen a backtracking of many countries. And why is that important? Zero dose children, it's 50% of the child mortality sit in these communities and two thirds of them are below the poverty line. So it's a really important issue if we can bring them into the healthcare system. This is a great strategy for health security, but also for, for reducing poverty. Now, as I mentioned, um, the, the model of Gavi is very interesting because we start off with new vaccines that are very expensive, and that's why they initially weren't being used. And we work to bring down those prices. I'll show you that in a second. When countries are very poor, they join, and we ask them just to pay a little bit, but they pay in hard currency. So the Minister of Finance sets up a line item for vaccines, and that's very important because over time you want them to grow that, that support nationally. As a country gets wealthier and moves through the um, uh, threshold, and these adjust over time based on inflation, you move into a preparatory transition, and then the costs increase by 15% a year. And then you cross another threshold, and you have five years. And by the way, the board is looking at maybe extending this to eight years. We're having that discussion in December. But right now, five years to take on the full cost of those vaccines. And then you are fully self-financing, but we stay with you, and we keep making sure the prices are good and we also have ways to assist the countries afterwards. But this is the model, and as I said, we've had 17 countries graduate from Gavi, and they're all continuing to use the vaccines that are in front of them. This is to give you a sense of the power of Gavi to do market shaping. So um, the approximate US price for the 11 vaccines that WHO recommends, and actually this is slides a little old, it's actually about $1,300 now for one child for that combined 11 different vaccines, and we get them for um, about $24. So you can see we've got a massive reduction in price, and that's important. It saves donor resources, but as importantly, it saves resources for countries and makes it affordable for countries to eventually transition out. And so we get the lowest prices in the world for all the vaccines that we provide, and that's true even for COVID vaccines, where every single company ultimately gave us the best prices in the world. So, thank you. So what are we trying to do? In, in this strategic period, we're trying to have a 25% reduction in zero-dose children. We're trying to reach 300 million additional children to avert seven to eight million deaths. 
a 10% further reduction in child mortality, and economic benefits of 80 to $100 billion. So these are big, ambitious goals um, that we're working on now. Of course, we didn't expect to have this big pandemic, although we knew pandemics were going to occur sometime. And so we're not exactly on target for all of this, but we're working hard to continue to do this work. So as I mentioned, we're pivoting to a new strategy of, of looking for zero-dose children. And, and, and what do you have to do to do that? And this becomes very important. Um, so first of all, we have a new dedicated financing mechanism that is directed at equity. And Uganda here is eligible for this. And we're discussing, right now is the discussion for providing additional financing, <coughs> excuse me, to work on <coughs> this equity issue. Um, there also is um, important to have a differentiated approach, and this includes the issue now that, you know, when I was here many, many years ago, the thing we talked about was the tukul that was in the rural areas, but of course today, big problem is in urban slums. <clears throat> and in urban slums, you need specified or specific tactics, and also, um, what do we do with um, refugees, nomadic populations, in conflict, et cetera. So um, these are different approaches that we would do to deal with trying to reach um, zero-dose children. <coughs> We're also trying to create new partnerships to bring in academic institutions, to bring in civil society, to help with that, to reach out to communities. And I had an opportunity to visit village health workers um, here on this trip and to see how they are being um, uh, a part of the effort to move forward. We need intersectoral collaboration, and we also need innovation as a priority. <coughs> Let me move to COVAX and say a few words about this. So when we were sitting in Davos in 2020, President Trump was sitting down the street saying there was no problem, everything was fine, everything, there was no problem with the disease. And of course, um, uh, we said we're not sure about that and we're quite worried about it, in fact. So we decided to try to put together a new effort because we knew in the previous um, pandemic, thank you, in the previous um, uh, pandemic of, of flu, we had a situation where um, uh, uh, the vaccines were bought up by the wealthy countries and not made available at all to the developing countries. So that was what we were trying to prevent. And we had a big debate. Do we just do the normal Gavi countries or do we go broader? And we decided to go broader because we knew many countries would have problems having access to vaccines. And so we ended up um, uh, supporting the largest actively uh, managed portfolio of vaccines globally. We had 11 vaccines in the portfolio. For the, for the low-income countries, we provided vaccines free of charge. And then um, we also, for countries that were wealthier, who couldn't access vaccines, we'd provide vaccines, but they had to pay for them, but they got a, a discounted price because they were buying them in bulk um, with us. Of, this, of course, did not mean that we didn't have problems. Um, and, and what was interesting is we started when we didn't even know if there were any vaccines. You heard I had a, a, a life career of working in HIV vaccines, which we still don't have a vaccine for. There was no guarantee we would have vaccines. But science paid off here, and this is the amazing thing. Um, this, if you look at this time sequence, it was 327 days from the time the, the, the genetic sequence was published until the time the first vaccine was given. And just to give, put that in perspective, the previous world record was four years, um, which was for mumps vaccine. Um, turned out it took us five years for Ebola, although we used vaccines experimentally in the interim until they were licensed. So this is an extraordinary call out to science. The first vaccine was done in um, a high income country. This is a, a grandmother in the UK. She received the first vaccine on December 8th. And we gave our first vaccine on the 16th of January, um, 39 days later. Again, traditionally, there were years between access in wealthy countries and, and developing countries. Our goal, though, is not to be happy with 39 days. We want it to be the same time. And so we still need to improve on this. Um, we had our first doses administered in Africa. Why was that delayed? There, we didn't have regulatory approval for the doses. We had to wait until WHO approved them. 
Um, and we were in the process of scaling up dramatically, and then we had all kinds of problems, vaccine nationalism, export bans, and, um, you know, but we um, promised that we would um, uh, deliver 950 million doses to um, developing countries by the end of 2021. It took us to the 15th of January to do it, but we did do it, but it was heavily weighted towards the back, which was unfortunate, and these are lessons that we have to learn. Today, as you've heard, we've shipped more than 1.8 billion doses. And um, the important point now is the problem is demand. We have enough doses for anybody who wants them, and the challenge is having demand. This just covers the um, places in the world where the doses have been shipped. Um, I, I, um, I, I must say that one of the important issues is vaccine hesitancy. Here you have um, the president receiving his um, dose, um, and I thank the immunization manager for providing um, a couple of slides in my presentation. Um, uh, but, um, you know, it, this, having this type of political leadership, which we had to do in all countries to say these vaccines are safe, the rumors have been terrible. Many of them have been started in wealthy countries for political reasons. My own country, only two-thirds of the population is vaccinated, only one-third is boosted. That's an absolute disgrace, and this has to do with political rumors and, and misleading false news, which is killing people, and it shouldn't happen. But what we need in every country is to have the population educated, and, and the Minister of Health, my good friend, is working all the time, as is the President. We discussed with the President and need to continue to do that. Today, Uganda has about 70 to 75 percent of your healthcare workers vaccinated. That should be 100 percent. But for the elderly, it's only about 50 percent. Again, that should be 100 percent. And I know you have other problems, but we are continuing to see new waves of variants. And the worry is we'll get a variant that's worse. It'll sweep through the country, and it will kill your elderly particularly. And therefore, we need to get them vaccinated when we're in a period when there isn't a massive um, outbreak. So this is a, a call going forward. In producing COVAX, believe it or not, we had to produce a whole other set of things. There wasn't a global mechanism to do emergency use authorization. We had to work with institutions to create cost-sharing mechanism. We wanted to deal with humanitarian populations. Here in Uganda, we're providing specific financing for um, uh, some of the refugee populations here. Working on manufacturing, um, indemnification and liability, um, also creating a no-fault compensation. So if somebody has a side effect from a vaccine, they can get a cash um, a payment um, to make it easy for them to uh, be able to deal with this. And then, of course, um, making sure that, that vaccines are labeled to be used globally and not in an individual country if we're going to move them around. So all of this had to be built, and one of the things we're trying to make sure is that we can keep these alive going forward for the inevitability, evolution, evolutionarily ev evitability, inevitability of having more pandemics, which we will. Why is that? Climate change is elevating the risk of disease. We're seeing things um, like famine and forced displacements. We're seeing um, uh, cyclones occurring that cause outbreaks. We're seeing vectors move as a result. Pressure on populations to the rural areas leading to um, contact with animals and then zoonotic diseases. So we are estimating that there's about a 2% increase a year of having a severe outbreak like COVID type. And so we're working hard to try to detect, prevent, and respond, and supporting on global health security. And you heard that we create global stockpiles. The way those work is anyone in the world who needs those vaccines can get access. If you're a Gavi country, you get them free of charge with support. If you're a wealthy country, you get them and you pay us back when you get a chance. And so um, we're doing a lot of work on outbreaks. We've done 1.4 billion doses of campaign vaccines as part of this effort. And just as an example, um, you know, cholera was the disease that people didn't like to talk about. So we'd have countries would have what they would call outbreaks of um, acute diarrhea or, you know, um, um, uh, you know the, the, nobody wanted to use the word cholera. But now that we have an effective cholera vaccine that's oral and, and really works well, all of a sudden countries are stepping up and saying, we have a cholera outbreak. And, 
So sometimes my team is surprised because I cheer when a country leader says we have a cholera outbreak. It's not because I'm happy they have a cholera outbreak, but I'm happy that they admit that they have an outbreak. And you can see this. when the first um, oral cholera vaccine got pre-qualified. We invested in stockpiles after that, and you can see now being use around the world. This year, we've had to move from two-dose vaccine to one dose because there are so many cholera outbreaks going on around the world, and I suspect more with the flooding we've seen in Pakistan with the climate change that we're seeing. So this is a new world of pandemics that we're going to be seeing going forward, and we have to be prepared for it. Now, as we are at a university, I want to talk about one important thing that we do, which is our innovation program. And this program, it cuts across everything. It's not just technology, but it's also services, it's finance. And just as, as five examples, um, on, the, on the health system, um, having a controlled temperature change so vaccines can, can stay in, in warmer temperatures. In immunizations, the auto-disabled syringes to prevent spread of infectious diseases. Um, in digital and technological systems, um, uh, uh, electronic vaccine intelligent networks. Um, the, the different practices, training, the, the, some of the innovations I talked about for COVID. And finally, on innovative financing, we've raised significant capital. Um, this year, um, our, our IFM program crossed the 10 billion threshold um, and we, the AMC for advanced market commitment for Ebola vaccines, um, we raised um, um, more than uh, $12.5 billion just in the course of one year. So these are innovations that are important. We're always looking to innovate, and there's a role for universities and researchers to work on it. An example of a, of a really just interesting innovation is Zipline. When they, they, they are a company that started in, in, uh, in outside of Silicon Valley, um, with the concept of being able to deliver in these disposable packages. Um, and, you know, in the U.S., it's very hard to get regulatory approval. There are airports everywhere. There's local, state, you know, many complications. So they decided with us to go to Rwanda. And the, why, the reason we got involved was because we thought this is a great way to distribute rabies vaccine. If a person gets bitten by a dog that's rabid, you can't have rabies vaccine in every clinic. It's too expensive, but you could just take it there. And um, we also thought about snake bite, anti-venom serum. But um, uh, what, what Rwanda said once they began to start working on it, said, you know, the real big problem um, was uh, blood. And the reason is, is they didn't have blood banks everywhere and they didn't have components. And so they set up a, a, a central blood bank and a system that anywhere in the country you could text and within 20 minutes, you would have that blood of the right type, the right components. And if you had a car accident with multiple people injured, you could get some units. If you needed more units, you could get more. Wastage went to zero. Supply went up and saved an enormous number of lives. But of course, one of the things we said is, um, you know, Rwanda is not necessarily representative of all of Africa. And the service next went to Ghana. In, in 2019, and there um, it now covers the whole country and not only serves for vaccines and, and, and other goods, but when COVID came, a lot of the COVID vaccines were delivered during the lockdown period to different communities. Um, and they're now in Nigeria, they're about to open in Ethiopia. And so this is about taking a technology and learning how to use it and then making it broadly available. And it turns out it's cheaper than using car services to deliver because um, you can be right on spot, and these are electric recyclable um, engines. Just to give you an example of some of the really interesting work that gets done. Finally, just on, on, on the general, um, we are aware that, of course, in Africa, um, there's a big demand for vaccines, um, but there's very little vaccine production. So we're now working to try to work with the, um, uh, the Partnership for African Vaccine Manufacturing, the African CDC, to try to help um, uh, see about having vaccine manufacturing on the continent. Vaccine manufacturing is very complicated, takes a long time, and it needs a whole ecosystem. It's not just a plant. It's easy to build a plant, but um, um, uh, we're trying to work to make sure that we can move towards that and have some rationale of the now 30 different projects that are underway across the continent. Now let me move just to Uganda for a few minutes before I close. Um, uh, this is the slide I originally, um, you know, wanted to put up to show you 
um, Uganda's performance. Of course, there has been some drops in, in, in performance of, uh, over time, but actually the thing that's amazing about Uganda is it had an up uptick again and a recovery. So Uganda's done much better than many of its peers. Um, here on the, on the right is a map of zero-dose districts, and this is the type of tracking we have to do um, uh, going forward. Um, this is a slide, again, the immunization manager gave me, and it, and it just points to how far we've come as a, as a country. So as I said, when I was here, it was 21% in the 1986 period, and, and of six antigens in a 15 million population, and today we're at 91% coverage. Um, with 13 antigens and 44 million population. So this is extraordinary, and as the immunization manager explained, you can see these lines coming together. These lines are the first dose versus the third dose, which looks at service delivery. So um, Uganda is doing um, very well. Of course, you still do have zero dose, and we have to work to bring those under control. So some of the barriers to immunization here in Uganda are these dropout rates um, I just showed you, um, a growing number of zero-dose children in urban slums and conflict areas, um, inefficiencies um, in the financial flows, supply chain and data between the central level going out to the districts and, and subnationally, some of the vaccine hesitancy that's particularly come into place with COVID vaccines, a health workforce that is fatigued and undercompensated, and there's a 38 um, percent vacancy rate in your in your health work workforce. We discussed that with the president. Um, it really does need to be filled, so we have the health workers that are available. And then um, HPV took a really um, uh, tough hit because schools were closed, and obviously that's the delivery service for for um, uh, schoolgirls. So Uganda has a really ambitious plan, I have to say, and. I love the ambition. Um, they want to extend into communities that reach the zero dose. They want to work in the subnational and try to solve the problems there. They have a series of, of planned new vaccine introductions for this year, yellow fever, measles, rubella, the second dose, um, uh, IPV, that's inactivated polio vaccine, second dose, and a, and a relaunch of the HPV. Um, given what's going on right now with um, still COVID here and with, with uh, Ebola, we may have to push some of these um, into um, uh, next year, but um, the ambition is, is really good. They want to do more on the COVID-19 vaccine, um, and they want to work on new strategies of using multi-antigen delivery, and multimodal strategies, and these are, are really important. So the challenge is going to be to get the subnational work um, better, including financing, include improving the data visibility and supply chain management, and that's where innovation comes in, and then bringing more voices from the community and advocacy from religious leaders, et cetera, to help us. Um, uh, the frontline workers are, are, are really important. You've got volunteers, you've got health workers in rural areas, and that's going to be a lot of the answer, and how do we work them and train them? Today, you can give them a cell phone, you can give them uh, continuing service education, digitality, you can have manuals available in local language, et cetera, et cetera. We can capture that and put it right into the health information system. This is all possible. It's all happening in Uganda. How do we make it systematic? Let me just finish um, uh, because I, I would be amiss to not talk about it. Um, you do have a, an outbreak of Ebola Sudan. I, I personally will say for the global community, it's a disgrace that we don't have a vaccine fully ready for Ebola Sudan because when we had the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, we worked to make sure that there would be an Ebola Zaire vaccine. And we now have a stockpile that's licensed. We have a half a million doses always available. And we use doses when they get close to their shelf life. If we don't need them for outbreaks, we then vaccinate health workers. And here in Uganda, we've vaccinated some health workers. And we've also worked on the, on the Zaire border to um, uh, provide some vaccination to try to protect. But we did not take Ebola Sudan. I mean, we're not the research people, so I don't want to say, you know, Gavi didn't, but the global community didn't. But now there is an accelerated effort uh, to move forward. And um, I think it's great that Uganda is going to be the research place that this is going to be tested. And I thank Uganda for doing that and for accelerating it.
we need rigorous research, we do need rigorous ethics, and we need to make sure that, you know, we do these things carefully, but this knowledge is not only for Uganda, it's for the region, it's for the world. And so thank you for doing this. The one request, of course, is no delays in doing this because we may, we may need this globally as a, as a priority going forward um, for other countries, and we're in the process of trying to get those doses as quickly as possible. Um, and so you, what you're doing now is using your traditional mechanisms, and Uganda's got to be the best place in the world to control Ebola outbreaks, your experience. You have the history of being the only country in the world who has had an Ebola outbreak with one case. That's extraordinary, because normally the way you diagnose Ebola is somebody comes in with a... Somebody comes in with a weird disease, and you treat the patient, and only when the health workers then get sick do you know it's not just a, a case of malaria? And then by then, those health workers have been taken care of by other health workers, and you have a cluster. So Uganda has had, uh, in the past, um, really, really good control. Um, um, and so you need to do that now. Of course, the secret on that is contact tracing, contact tracing, contact tracing, and not having people go underground, travel, and we've seen that's happened. And, and I know this is what the minister is um, spending all day and all night trying to deal with. Um, in terms of vaccinations, we are lucky to have, um, there are actually six different vaccines, but three are um, on, at the top of the, of the queue in terms of, of, of um, having had testing in animal models, having um, some testing in humans, having pretty good sense that these will work, but of course you don't know until they're tested. And so um, we hope that all three will be fast-tracked to testing, um, but obviously, um, you know, our hope would be that the epidemic ends first. That's always our hope, but um, we want to we wanna get these tested if we can so that we're ready for this outbreak if it gets worse or for future ones. But just to be clear, it's not a silver bullet. We're not waiting for this because we still need contact tracing even if we have a vaccine because you vaccinate in a ring fashion around cases and you protect because you don't have enough particularly at the beginning, to vaccinate the whole country or community or East Africa. So you have to really track it and be able to do it. Um, I want to end just making a few thank yous and a few pictures here. And um, first on the top left are the, um, the, the WHO uh, resident rep who's here and our UNICEF regional colleague. Our partners are absolutely critical to what we do. Um, uh, below is a picture of the minister who um, we opened this um, new cold chain facility, the largest in, in um, East Africa, certainly, maybe on the continent, and, and um, for paying attention to that. In the middle, President Museveni, who has been a champion for vaccines. Um, I've known him for 36 years, and he has always been a champion for public health and vaccines, and we gave him a little award there, and you can see uh, the minister right in the center there. Um, on the top right, the commissioning of the new facility, and then on the bottom right, um, um, only because I don't have all my old pictures because they're in storage when I moved to Geneva, is a picture from last year's uh, a ceremony here at Macareri, but somewhere I've got pictures of of all of the work here in the past, and I wish I had those to put up there. But I want to thank all of you for what you're doing for the country, and I'm happy to ask, answer any questions if there's time, um, but I hope I've given you a little education into how far Uganda's come, the things that are still challenging, and also what we're trying to do globally. Thank you. Yes, in line with our program. Uh, the DVCs and members of management, our invited guests, ladies and gentlemen. The policy on award of honorary degrees of Macquarie University says they will be given sparingly. And to only those persons who have done a lot, only those persons who have done a lot to make the life of humanity better. Dr. Seth Buckley's nomination is the only one which I have chaired where there was no debate. And you know Makere likes debate. 
But in this case, there was no debate, neither in the Senate nor at council. It was so easy to pass his nomination. And that happened because of the enormous work he has done for humanity. But of course, selfishly, we were looking first at what he has done for Makerere. And I'm happy that you are our alumnus, you have taught here, you have worked here in the 80s, you have done a tremendous work for Uganda, but importantly, you have done a lot of work for humanity. And we, as Makerere, we as Makerere are proud to be associated with you and to be associated with your great work. It is therefore with great pleasure that we are going to gown you almost uh, more than a year since you were awarded the degree, but we are very happy that you finally came and that we'll be able to gown you so that you become now even more a permanent member of the Makerere Convocation, our proud alumnus. <laughs> so may I request the Dean to help me to gown you, sir. Congratulations for the moment, just for three minutes. Yes, that's beautiful. Vice Chancellor, it's next. And this ceremony would not have been graced by a more appropriate <laughs> guest of honor. We would not have had a more appropriate guest of honor than our Minister of Health, Dr. Acheng Ruth. Dr. Ruth Acheng, I think, is probably the busiest minister right now. Let me say for the last two or three years, not just in Uganda, but maybe on the African continent, you have been the busiest minister. And you have done a lot to keep our country safe. We want to thank you very much, but that is expected of a Makerere alumnus anyway. Huh? We want to thank you very much for your hard work, for every effort that you have made to protect us first from COVID-19 and now from Ebola. And I remember that uh, video clip at the airport in 2021, I think in March, where I saw returnees harassing you and you stood your ground and said, I have a responsibility to keep this country safe. And you did it. Congratulations. 
it is now my pleasure to invite you to address the congregation. And I also noticed that you are one of the few people in the audience wearing masks. The Vice Chancellor of Makerere, all the deans in your respective capacities, and our graduate today, congratulations, Dr. Seth Beckley. Indeed, we have waited for this day when we would see you gowned and it has come to pass. Thank you for coming. Um, allow me first of all to thank Makere University for honoring Dr. Seth Beckley, whom I call a brother, but is also Ugandan at heart because he has loved Uganda from the time when he stepped in Uganda. And you saw from his presentation that dates back to the time of HIV, and he moved on to support us with vaccines, including the work on the HIV vaccine. So we want to say thank you very much. I have had opportunity to work with uh, Dr. Beckley since he took over Gavi. That's more than 12 years ago. Then I was the DG, and I eventually became the minister, and we've had very good interactions. Dr. Seith, as you heard, revamped our vaccination program in 1987, when the coverage was below 30%. And I recall one of those days when we traveled with him, I think it was to Buikwe to launch the pneumococcal vaccine, and he asked me whether I would say the truth in the presence of the president that our vaccination coverage was less than 50%, or I would keep quiet. And when I said the truth, he said, thank you very much. It means you will progress. I still say the truth up to today. I don't mince words. We have had very dedicated financing from Gavi since 1987, and Gavi has been very consistent. And to date, we have received over 500 million US dollars for vaccination. And it is not only for vaccines, we also receive funds for health system strengthening and support for mobilization of the communities to get vaccines. And that is why our coverage has been progressively improving, except now with the anti-vaxxers and the myths and the misconceptions. We received overwhelming support during um, the COVID pandemic, which still continues and to date, we have over, nearly over 20 million doses of COVID vaccines in the country. Thank you very much to the Vaccine Advisory Committee. And I see some of the members in the room, Professor Seruada, <laughs> Professor Sewan Kambo, and many others who supported us during um, the time of receiving the COVID vaccines. 
Since then, shortages of vaccines are a history. We have adequate vaccines for routine immunization, and even when we introduce new vaccines, we have adequate amounts, including funding to support the program. And all these thanks to Gavi. We are now on the road to introduce two, two new vaccines. One of them is the malaria vaccine. And again, the NITA group are here. At least I see Dr. Sabrina. We are preparing for that. And the hepatitis B bath dose, all supported by Gavi and championed by Dr. Seth Beckley, who keeps on insisting Uganda should be one of the first countries to receive the malaria vaccine. We are having a malaria epidemic. Many of you may be aware of that. And we are losing a good number of children every day, including to the black water fever. So the sooner we get the malaria vaccine, the better. I also want to appreciate Gavi uh, through Dr. Seth Beckley. You heard him talk about the cold room. It is actually the biggest in Africa. And I will take you through its capacity, and especially for the researchers, you don't need to run anywhere to look for a cold room. For two to eight degrees, we have over 2,796 cubic liters ready for vaccines. For minus 20, it is 40 cubic meters, and for minus 80 degrees, 7,280 cubic meters. So we have space, even for Ebola vaccines, whatever vaccines you think about, we have adequate space. And I invite you one of these days just to visit the new national medical stores and see for yourself what Gavi has done, all at the cost of Gavi. I will now mention the challenges, since he always wants me to say the truth. The challenge is not Gavi, the challenge is us. We are the challenge to Gavi. And Gavi is yet to find a solution with us. One of the challenges is that we don't account for resources. And we've been moving back and forth on this issue. And yet the more we account, the more money we get. When we don't account, we even have to refund. So what innovative ways can we come up with to ensure that we account for the money? The second challenge is the vaccine hesitancy. And again, I will leave that to NITAG and the Vaccine Advisory Committee to find solutions. Otherwise, we are going to have huge expiries of COVID-19 vaccines in the country if we don't address that. I want to thank the parents that we don't have challenges with the routine vaccines. The parents willingly take their children. Gavi is still committed to support Uganda in spite of these challenges and even build more capacity like we have done right to the health center three levels. We have refrigerators up to health center three. So we can actually reach the last person in the community with vaccines. There is no challenge to that. And not only that, we even have refrigerators in the stores waiting for deployment wherever there is need. So all this is your work, Dr. Seth Beckley, and we are very appreciative. <clears throat> Lastly is an appeal. Dr. Seth Beckley is soon retiring. He loves Uganda, Uganda is his home. And I have been telling him there is no better place to retire than Uganda and in Makerere and continue with research. 
together with our scientists. And of course, continue to support the Ministry of Health. So congratulations once again. We are very proud of you. Thank you very much. My school, the School of Public Health, I know many people refer to me as a pediatrician, but I am also from the School of Public Health. Thank you very much for honoring him. And thank you for organizing this beautiful ceremony today. We appreciate. Yes, today is a very special day for all of us. Once again, to the entire audience here at Makere University Yusuf Dule Central Teaching Facility, thank you for honoring the invitation. And also in a very special way, we thank our online audience. We have over 115 people following the event online. May I, we have next on the program, souvenir ceremony. In the spirit of still congratulations to Dr. Seth. May I humbly invite Professor David Serra Dafast to move to the podium. He has wonderful memories about Mark Kerry University School of Public Health at 25. So let Professor David Serada join us here, and we'll start with him. Thereafter, I'll also invite the Vice Chancellor to convey our regards and souvenirs to Dr. Seth. Um, <clears throat> it's a great pleasure, Dr. Seth Barclay, for Makere School of Public Health to give you this plaque. And this plaque was <clears throat> supposed to be presented to you on the 16th of October in appreciation for your contribution to the 25 years of Masters of Public Health training at Makere University School of Public Health in Makere. Just to recap, uh, Seth Barclay, as the Dean of the School of Public Health pointed out, uh, was uh, Associate uh, Director for Science in Rockefeller. And with support of Rockefeller, we started <coughs> the first public health school without walls, the first masters of public health school without wall, for which up to now, it continues. So this plaque is really an appreciation for all those contributions over the years. And I request uh, Dr. Seth to remain where he's standing. May I request the Vice Chancellor also to come forward? The word is congratulations, right? But with some befitting hand clap. <laughs> All right, and to those online, maybe thumbs up. Yes, we have um, a set of souvenirs from Makere University that the Vice Chancellor is passing on to Dr. Seth. Is this the set or the others? <laughs> That's the set. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yes, next photo moment, may I humbly request um, the Honorable Minister to join the team here. Yes, Professor Roda Wanyense, kindly also join. The Principal, College of Health Sciences, Professor Damalina Kanjako. The two DVCs. Deputy Vice Chancellor Academic Affairs, Professor Umal Kakumba, Deputy Vice Chancellor Finance and Administration, Professor Henry Naitwe, Director Research and Wow, the Academic Regents from Makere University, <laughs> Professor Vyin Zamkadas. I need an induction. <laughs> We also request the World Health Organization country representative to join the photo. Yes. It's a special day for us. Makere University is celebrating 100 years of existence. And we also have a distinguished researcher, scholar, and Dr. Seth, who has significantly contributed to making the world a better place. Congratulations. <laughs> now, may I still request that entire team to join Dr. Seth as he cuts the cake. There is a cake over there with the word congratulations. Yes, is Dr. Seth holding the knife? Yes, I'm going to count from 1,000 to zero. <laughs> All right, and to the online audience, please bear with us. Yes, five, two, one, cut. Yes, congratulations. Congratulations to you. What is following next is we have um, kindly take your seats. The Honorable Minister of Health and Dr. Seth, together with Professor Roda Wanyenze, to get just outside the auditorium. Davidson in Diabahika, the communication officer, is going to manage the media engagement. Now, to the rest of the team, I request that we remain seated for a few minutes. Kindly take a bite. We have delicious snacks that have been prepared, courtesy of Makere University School of Public Health. And to our online audience, thank you for being with us. We are glad we've ended the gowning ceremony and public lecture successfully today 
Monday, 7th November 2022, at Makere University, Yusuf Lule, Central Teaching Facility Auditorium. God bless you all.